Good evening. I'm Barbara Honda, a member of the Princeton Club's Program Committee. Thank you all for joining us for a fascinating night as we welcome the world's premier futurist, Faith Popcorn, as she explores corona cocooning, our post-pandemic future. From Faith's 1974 founding of her futurist marketing firm, known as the Brain Reserve, to the publication of the Popcorn Report, Faith has mesmerized audiences for decades. As the key strategist for Brain Reserve, Faith applies her insights to cultural and business trends to enable established brands and companies develop new business models and to innovate for sustainable growth. Faith's legendary leadership and her uncanny ability to identify and apply emerging societal and cultural changes at least a decade out is the centerpiece of her legendary career. Faith always asks the basic question, if you knew everything about tomorrow, what would you do differently today? To answer this question, Faith analyzes cultural and business trends to enable her clients to develop new business models and products and to innovate their companies for sustainable growth. Faith's foresight has been described as surprising, even shocking, but her recommendations have always created a valuable path shaping the direction of the Fortune 500. With a documented 95% accuracy rate, Faith's future view presentations focus on how societal and political trends are impacting the future of consumer lifestyles and their subsequent purchasing behavior. In 1981, Faith was the first to identify and name the cocooning trend that expresses a person's craving for safety in an increasingly uncertain world. In addition, Faith has identified such sweeping societal movements such as 99 Lives, Being Alive, Anchoring, Atmosphere, Cashing Out, and The Vigilante Consumer. Faith was the first to anticipate the explosive growth of subscription services, home delivery, fresh organic foods, home businesses, and homeschooling. Faith has documented her insights in numerous books, such as Clicking, Evolution, The Dictionary of the Future, and of course, The Popcorn Report. Faith is a trusted advisor to the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, such as Allergan, American Express, Apple, Campbell Soup, Citigroup, Chipotle, Colgate, Comcast, Constellation Brands, Tyson, Investec, Coca-Cola, IBM, J&J, &J, KFC, Mars, Pfizer, Unilever, Nike, PepsiCo, Kodak, just to name a few. During times of uncertainty, Faith has propelled global corporations to double-digit market share gains because of her ability to describe tomorrow with astounding accuracy. Faith has been named the Trend Oracle by the New York Times and the Nostradamus of Marketing by Fortune Magazine. Faith has been invited to speak all over the planet on subjects such as the future of masculinity, child free by choice, evolution, the rise of the female, and the rise of fake foods. Among her engagements are the Wall Street Journal, The Future of Everything, Dubai's Arab Innovation Summit, and Richard Van Branson's famous event, Business is an Adventure in South Africa. During the pandemic, Faith launched a podcast entitled, my favorite, Jolty, with the first episode named, Where's My Blankie? Followed by another episode entitled Jolt Miss. Is Christmas Dead? You can tune into her podcast on YouTube. Born in New York City, Faith is a sixth generation New Yorker from the East Village. 
Both her parents were lawyers and Faith spent her early childhood in Shanghai, China. Before returning to the US, she attended the New York High School of Performing Arts, followed by New York University. She was accepted into law school, but she decided that she wanted to go into advertising where she worked for eight years. In 1974, she founded the Brain Reserve. And as I, they say, the rest is history. On a personal note, Faith is a single mother and has two daughters, both adopted from China, ages 22 and 16. Without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce the incomparable Faith Popcorn. Barbara, my God. It was so much. <laughs> my, my pleasure. That's such a nice intro. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Um, well, thank you. Well deserved. It's so good of you. Um, I just, you know, I, I just like to tell you a couple of things about, you know, beside all that is most often or often asked question is, how, how did you become a futurist? And I don't think you become a futurist. I think you are a futurist. So it took me a little bit to understand that I was a futurist. Um, when I was working in advertising, I was like, I thought I was Holly Golightly, you know, <laughs> at Tiffany's. And then I found out, no, you know, it wasn't so ho Holly Golightly that, that agencies at that time and maybe all time, we're not really showing clients what was going to happen. So how do you decide what to do now if you don't know where it fits in the future? And I, right. I, uh, my sister used to say like, you know, I'm, I'm the opposite of a loner. You know, <laughs> I, I have a, like a group wherever I go. And I always had this incredible well, at that time, it was maybe 100 people, you know, close friends, really smart friends. Like, um, we used to go to Max's Kansas City and places like that. And I've always been asking, them, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? You know, like a lot of women, um, we form focus groups and elevators. Guys are always going like, do you have to talk to everybody? And the answer is, yeah, we have to. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I had this little, like, coterie, this little brain reserve, and I took the smartest people that I knew. Um, I left the agency. I started Faith Popcorn's Brain Reserve, and they were the brain reserve. So you could never hire all these people because it would be so expensive. I mean, who would? I only had no money. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I used them in this way where we were saying, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? And uh, I don't think I had a client for 10 years. Um, my sister used to bring me tuna fish, you know, in cans because I was also mad at my mother, as usual, you know, <laughs> women are always mad at their mothers. And um, one time the New York Times called me. No, it was Fortune. They called me. And I was like, wow, this is everything. Mm -hmm. I prepared like what I thought was going to happen. Um, I wrote notes. I, you know, I, I, I wrote like I had notes about if I had a client, this is what I would tell them. Of course, I didn't have <laughs> any clients. And so they came. And at that time, I was working out of my apartment. I started my company on a credit card, like most people do. Um, every time they call me, you know, every month, the diners club then call me. Are you yes. going to have to pay your bill? I go, my trust check hasn't come in yet. <laughs> They were very, I trust very high. I always love, I'll always love Diners Club, wherever they are. And um, the Fortune magazine came up, and this is the story of how, you know, really I got my name, because that's the second most, you know, asked question. People go, how did you get that name, Popcorn? So they came up, and they said, you know, they sat down. They had pencils then, you know, and, and pads. They right, said, sure. We want to know how you got your name. I said, that's why you're here? Because I had all these notes prepared. And, I said, you know, kind of why else would we be here? So that annoyed me a bit. And I said, well, um, and this was honestly at the moment, spur of the moment. I said, um, in, in Italy, you know, many, you know, a generation ago, 
my great great grandfather, his name was, you know, um, uh, uh, Corne. And as they were coming through immigration, you know, he was quite old, and they said, Sir, what is your name? And he said, My name is Papa Corne. Oh my God. And I shortened it, I told them. Wow. That's why they never interviewed me again. And they published this, the Papa Corne story. And I told them that's how I got my name. So that was that. But the real way I got my name was, my name was Plotkin, and I worked uh -huh. with this Italian art director. And right. his name was Gino Constantino Garlanda. And he couldn't say Faith Plotkin? I mean, what? It's my first job. And he just said, Faith Popcorn. And I thought, you know, that's good. And I just took it. I did an AKA also known as, and I changed my name to Faith Popcorn. And people said, you must have done studies and interviewed people. And how did you decide this was the most wonderful name that you could ever think of? And it's so brilliant. And I go, no, that was just like that. And sometimes that's how the best things happen. Exactly. That was a brilliant uh, choice. I mean, it couldn't, it couldn't have more branding power. It, than, it was, than it it done. Go ahead. You know, funny story is my kid, my, my, kid that drives me crazy she's 22 years old a couple of years ago she said I, I want to talk to you mom I go what she goes to wash you in St. Louis she's become a midwesterner and I said what uh, Georgica her name used to be Gigi but now she's Georgica okay and, um she said I'm thinking of changing my name so what could I say I couldn't say oh that's terrible why would you change your name I said oh okay sure dear what are you going to change it to she said I was thinking of changing it back to Plotkin I oh. no. Oh. no. So Did she anyway, follow through with that? No. I thought if you don't say anything right away or yell or scream, a lot of times they forget about things. Right. It, it'll pass. He's still yes. popcorn, but who knows? So anyway, I'm so excited to be here. I'm going to give you a really fast future focus of what I believe is going to happen. Okay. Um, and then the way I learn actually is i want to hear from you in the audience i want to uh, just ask me a million questions if i don't get back to, you know if i don't like able to answer all of them uh tonight i will answer them personally after and that's what i'm hoping so don't think you're going to remember it jot them down or go into the question place and ask questions okay Please, everyone, if they have a question, uh, kindly enter it in the Q&A box, and um, we will hopefully get to every single question, at least. And hang on one second. What? I want to see Barbara. Oh, there you are. Okay. So um, this is, you know, this is the era of Corona. It's been a while. I had it in March. Um, did you? You did too? No, you had it? I had it. Oh, so I God. came home. I decided, ah, eh, you know, I just kept working, you know, and then I had the chills and stuff. And I w went out to the country with the warm, you know, I could call her my nanny, but she's really my kid's grandmother. Her name is Yang Seng Chin. And my little one, who's 16. And, you know, I didn't feel great. And then I had some chills and Cece had a little bit of like, you know, fever and my nanny had it like, you know, heavy, right? But we got, you know, we got through it. Right. And it, it, I guess I was, you know, one of the early ones to really understand, like, you know, I was lucky, right? What it sure. felt like. When I was sick, you know, I thought, and I never think like this because I love everything and I love to go out and I love to have fun and I love to ever, you know, just, I thought, you know what? If I die tonight, I thought, you know, okay, oh, uh, that's how you feel. And I, I don't think people talk about that. So it's really awful. Um, and, you know, as I say, we had it light, but um, 
So I started to really personally, not just from a research point of view or a marketing point of view, a positioning point of view, really want to look into this. You know, what the hell? Now, in 1981, I said the word to a reporter. Reporters are my friends. You know, people are cocooning, they're staying home, they're cozy. It was Martha Stewart era. Everything was like, you know, warm and runny and delicious. And I'll get into that in a minute. And I said, people are cocooning. And that was such an early take, was such an early spot. And so when I had Corona, I was thinking, okay, so this is really Corona cocooning. How are we, you know, cocooning in this era of Corona? And what's it going to be like after? And what will we be doing differently tomorrow? And that is really our brand. So the whole 45 years that I've had brain reserve, we've, we've, we've looked at changes in the culture, consumer behavior, exploring cultures of cocooning, post-pandemic aftershocks. And this presentation really showcases examples that are really like disrupting people. It's disrupting models. It's just, disrupting, um, you know, everything that we ever thought about before, we're starting to think about differently. And I think there's going to be a PTSD. Wait, did I get that? Post? Yeah. Right, PTSD. right. Post-traumatic. Yeah. Yes, about, about this. Because, you know, at first you go like, eh, you know, I, w I want to get out. I want to go somewhere. I'm sick of staying home. And then after a while, you get to kind of like, used to it and a little bit happy about it and um to come out of our cocoon is going to be and we should be talking about that tonight um quite something it's going to be not so easy so our brand is about and we've served the fortune 200 as i say for the last four decades if you knew everything about tomorrow what would you do differently today and another way to put that is if you walked out of your house, you saw the New York Times, and instead of saying 2020, it said 2030, you go like, what? And then you would look at where, the stock page, because you would say, what about knowing what would happen tomorrow? You know, what would I be, like, we all have this experience. We look at real estate. That's my one of my favorite hobbies. And you say, oh, all real estate people are people that love it. If I only had bought this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So suppose right. you could actually know what was going to happen and actually do something today. Wouldn't that be amazing? So we call that applied futurism. And, you know, when I go to a party, people say, oh, what's going to happen? You know, it's like um, a doctor, you know, they go, How, you know, take my pulse, whatever. It's not important. It's not hard even to know what was going to happen. It's hard to apply it to a company, to a brand, to a strategy. And that's why we call ourselves Applied Futurists. We Here are all my friends. My friends are logos. Um, we've worked for many of the Fortune 200, and uh, we've had some really great experiences with them. I've gotten a lot of, you know, notes. You know, sometimes it's hard to accept accept the future and people will say, oh, I, I don't think so, you know? They still right. have the bill, but they go like, I don't think so. And then they'll write later, how did you know, you know? So um, that's not so satisfying. And some of them believed it and actually made billions on it because investing in the future, a future that's gonna happen in the present is like incredible. It's like knowing what horse is gonna win. <laughs> so that's we, a good we have been 95% correct, Barbara, in, in, and, and everybody out there in our predictions. So people go, well, do you have like, you know, do you, do you have a crystal ball? My least favorite question. So please don't anybody ask me that. Um, no. Um, do, where do you, you know, do, how do you come up with this stuff? So I have developed over the years, something called a trend bank. And this trend, bank, this trend bank, if you look at this, think of this as Oculus. Look through these 17 lenses and see what's going to happen. Example, well, here's cocooning right on the bird's tail. 
Mm-hmm. And think about this. A lot of these were, were created or not created, but named, framed in 1980, 81, 82. Probably the latest one was evolution, which is, you know, the way women are going to change the future. That right. was um, probably um, 90 something, 93. Fantasy adventure was about gaming, going out into, you know, a, a, like, a, like a, a pathway um, of, of fantasy and excitement and anchoring is about, you know, um, finding roots in, you know, to hold us and make us feel secure. SOS, save our society. That's the goodness trend, how everybody's going like we have to be purpose driven. All these lenses were created much earlier than they actualized. But that's not so important. What's important is how do you apply them? How do you take a brand, a business and say, okay, people are going to stay home. They're icon toppling. They're going to hate big companies. They want to act like kids, Oreos. They want to, um, they want to play games. They are angry. They're marching vigilante consumer, pleasure revenge. They dyeing their hair pink and, you know, they just want to go crazy for a night. Um, gummies uh, and on. So this is the key, the code to the future. And wrapped around it is people that are making the future. These are 10,000 futurists that we have um, engaged with, collected over time. We know what they're working on. So one will say, oh, I'm working on genetic engineering. And we'll go, well, what do you mean? What is that? Oh, we slice this stuff together and you know, we can get rid of disease or we can you know, make a, 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 like a healthier child or whatever. And we know this stuff because they're in our talent bank eight, 10, 15 years early. And we take these futurists and then say, which are the trends? You know, which are these lenses? How does it connect? How do these lenses connect to what the futurists are saying? And that trend bank, plus talent bank equals the future. Now, this could all sound like flighty maybe, except that we have been 95% correct over the last four decades. So there must be something to it. Absolutely. I'll show you um, just one little example of a trend and how it morphs. Um, Take cocooning, like I said, in 87, it was warm and cozy, it became digital. Um, we helped create the minivan. Well, not help. We did. We said people are going to want a car cocoon, the do-it-yourself cocoon, the armored cocoon, like alarms and, you know, filtration, filtration here, filtered water, filtered information, filtered air, um, sharing the cocoon with people that aren't actually in your family. This is about gaming, Oculus, anticipatory, Corona right here and how we're gonna make ourselves whole again in regenerative cocoon. That's when medicine comes into your cocoon, healing powers, you know, aromatherapy. So this craving for safety in an an incredibly and increasingly uncertain world was certainly more than a passing fad. And many of our clients have made, you know, billions of dollars on figuring out how to market into the cocoon. This is kind of, this is like an upscale cocoon. <laughs> <laughs> and here's, here's what it looks like, like sheltering in place. People are becoming artists, quarantining out of fear, quarantining out of the concern for collective well-being, economic collapse, ecological renewal, isolation, solidarity, major boredom and setback comes into metamorphosis. People are becoming artists and writers and you know, growing tomatoes and growing themselves. And um, cocooning was so big in this time, this time today and tomorrow, that we actually segmented it. And it looked like this, armored cocoon, how are we protecting ourselves and keeping stuff out of the cocoon? And opposite here, communal cocoon, we're lonely. And we want to um, create like pods and people like us, PLU, and people that have the same interests. So um, you see how their oppos- you know, the opposition, the tension is there. Privileged, the money is here. 
the margins are here. There's, you know, uh, the group of people that are privileged want exclusive, they want to know exclusive people, exclusive products, platforms, services. They're really willing to um, save, I mean, they're really willing to spend and this cash constrained opposite looking for access to products and services that are sensitive to income limitation, recovery, we're recovering and we're growing in the cocoon. We have the fantasy cocoon, which is gaming, the do-it-yourself cocoon, which is not gaming. And today, tonight, I'm going to show you these six cultural forces. So as I said, I'm going to like, you know, I think I'm going to trot along the top, give you some examples. There's armored, there's privilege, there's growth, there's communal, there's recovery, and there's fantasy. And then um, we could take some questions. Interconnected life. This lockdown makes us crave clinical level clean and safe. I mean, you go to Costco, there's scrubbing the cart. I go like, really? My God, why didn't you think of this before? Yes. <laughs> Natural is not nearly enough. Serious germs and death count. I mean, we are scrubbing and washing and scared of germs and we're, excuse me, washing our hands. 95% of the population is under lockdown at the peak. The Cleveland Clinic is um, logging in 60,000 telemedicine visits a month. So the doctor going to the office, we're not going to go there. Now the office, the hospital, are places where you catch something, not where you get well. 400% growth in disinfecting products, you know, you know this. So here's some other expositions, and this is how we figure it out. We say, what are the uh, little red dots in the culture that are telling us that this is something really big, the signals? So give me Clorox. So these whole seventh generation and the lighter things, you know, have reduced Mrs. Myers, but Clorox, we want the real strong thing. We want industrial strength. Lysol, quarantine whopper, um, desperate time, premium prices. Um, you know, this was mean. A couple made $70,000 reselling Lysol to desperate to disinfect. This was early on. And then Corona kits, preparedness is a badge. Um, it's a new, like, you know, uh, what do you call it? Safety package. And even Burger King uh, sharing how to make a whopper at home. So that's interesting. People are sharing what's proprietary. So this was all signals of people like locked up. And then it got a little bit deeper. Self-scanning in home. Artificial intelligent apps scans your eyes, your tongue, nails it to intuit to vitamin deficiencies. What do you need? What are you missing? So this whole scanning, by the way, we predicted this app in the popcorn report in 1990. So it's there to be read. You Big predicted broad, the, we, the scanning of the, scanning, the eyes and, and nails? It would walk through your, the way we said it is, so 1990, today is 2020. So that's like, you know, 30. Right, right. We said be able to walk under your um, like doorway and it would scan you and tell you what you were lacking in vitamins, it would tell you how you're feeling. And then, you know, uh, toilet analysis, I don't want to go too deep into that, but you know, then Toto came out with that. Um, yeah, we knew this was gonna, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty obvious this is gonna happen. But to know it a little bit early is it to like invest, to develop, to know where you put your money. This is Big Brother Virus, please. By your voice and location, this tracker app promises to tell if you've been exposed. I guess really? somebody else should have that. Hmm, might send one over there. Seeking a pure place, Airbnb has coronavirus free status. So they are scrubbing places down so people feel safe to go to an Airbnb. And then monitor and modulate air quality. There's a real company called AWAR Sensors. They analyze and optimize the internal environment. 
So, you know, the CIA has ways of saying you're being bugged and this is saying your air is not good. You know, you're, you're, it's measuring everything around you. Responsive cocoon, the Jaguar is using artificial intelligence to detect your mood while you're driving. And if it's good, optimize it and maybe um, tell you to pull over if it's not so good. Tomorrow's Kitchen, Samsung, this exists today. Samsung's artificial reality space where appliance, appliances are your nutritionists. So there you are in your kitchen and this nutritionist pops up. Avatars are going to be enormous. Holograms are going to be enormous. It becomes your personal chef or shopping assistant. So I ask you, and you out there, if you have a company or you think about what to invest in, how, what is your right? How can you penetrate that armored cocoon that's so tightly locked up? What do you have to be for people to open their virtual doors to you? Here's privileged access in a world turned upside down. In a world of private cocoons, you don't make products, you make a vehicle for engagement and entertainment. So here's something called status spirits, um, 100 million right now, growing significantly ahead of the total global spirit market. Uh, Hanukkah Schlemmer, in the beginning, they had, their personal care items went up 500%. 49% of millennials say social media is driving them to spend money they don't have. So I feel Amazon is driving me to spend money. You know, you go on Amazon and they go, okay, spend another $30 and, and, and you get, you know, free delivery. So, and I looked up, how much is free delivery? $12. So I don't know, but it like gets you and holds you. Um, yes. Early access, premium services like red carpet home, cinema stream films before they are released. So you can watch movies before they're released. Soothing subscriptions, Mind Wander. This is a company, a women's mental health box for $20 a month, cheaper than a shrink. Curated deliveries, New York City's Bork Street Bakery offers luxurious essentials. So all these companies are springing up and, say, and looking for those who have like money and, you know, trying to be attractive and interesting and, you know, um, wanting to serve them. So um, here's Rayos. Do you know Rayos? You know, you can never the get a sauce. table. Yeah. Right? You can't get a table. Oh, hang on one second. Anthony, get, she wants a dog. Um, so here's Rayos. So you can get um, in this little 10 table restaurant. Now you can get home delivery. And I don't know if you've noticed that their are uh, their tomato sauces in supermarkets. Yes. Here, you know, elite in-home wellness, concierge doctors making house calls, telemedicine, enormous. And, you know, when we predicted that, is it crazy? People are going to want to see their doctors. No, they don't care. They just want to get well. Online bragging rights, digital only dress to be worn on social media. This was $10,000. It's not even that nice, is it? it didn't really no, work. not really. No. Kind of. <clears throat> um, so um, here's some more. PNG's Activate, a partnership with National Geographic focused on inspiring global activism. Tinder's original interactive video series, Swipe Night. Mailchimp presents a new entertainment division creating original series. Popular e-commerce, Shopify. Avon announced the creation of an in-house content studio. So all of this, these signals are saying that they're reaching into these privileged cocoons and inspiring them or selling them something. So how can you make people feel like VIPs? How do you sell them something that they feel only rich people can have? This one is growth. How can we use this pause to improve? Now, how many people said when this thing lockdown happened, I'm gonna learn Italian. I'm going to speak French. I'm going to get thin. Well, I just want to share. Nobody got thin. 
So how do we use this pause to improve? And it was more of an idea than anything that actualized, but Zoom boom, Zoom's valuation, valuation has more than doubled since January. It's now worth $14 billion. Headspace saw a 17%, uh, 17 more users completing its stress at home meditation, Headspace. Uh, here's more skill building, Rosetta Stone, teaching you languages. Happify app shares free yoga, access for all from Comcast to Coursera to colleges, free connectivity and learning, table stakes. I wanna learn something, I wanna be something. I wanna lie in bed and watch um, uh, Fargo. I'm just speaking for myself. And helping consumers soar, Goop giving back. Goop created a nightly Instagram series called Community Office Hours. Experts answer questions based on questions on Instagram stories. Here, just do it. Nike, gorgeous, premium training routines. Share what you know. Malt Society of Arabia invites whiskey brand ambassadors to lead um, free online tutorials, learning new skills. That guy that showed up at, in Central Park uh, giving people haircut and didn't charge them and just, you know, said, pay me whatever you think it's worth. So what metamorphosis, I was thinking, can you inspire in people to emerge as their best selves from their growth cocoons? Four is communal. Now, communal is interesting. People used to say, you know, you know, we want community, but actually we want people that remind us or share an interest with us. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not actually about diversity. It's about inversity. Detached from our usual rituals, we need new connections and communities, the opportunity to reevaluate who matters and what new tribes that we can join. So <clears throat> here's one, pre-happy hour, 38% claim to be boozing while working. I don't think they're just claiming, and I think that number's low. So <laughs> Rosé All Day has taken on- Rosé All Day. <laughs> right. <laughs> Virtual happy hour from bars attempting to attract a thousand people at a time, which is larger than what they could actually fit in their you know, actual bar. Some signals. Here's one. Um, Miller creates a virtual tip jar to support um, bartenders and waiters that are out of work. Uh, Bush offered a year of free beer to couples that had to delay their weddings. And, you know, it's just like brands are starting to do some nice things and starting to fit in with this vibe of we're staying at home, we're missing stuff, life is upside down. And those brands that are doing it right create like deep connections. So here Chipotle celebrates and feeds healthcare workers. How's that? Nice, very nice. Yeah, stepping away, stepping up. United Healthcare's Andrew Witte takes a leave of absence to, to join WHO's COVID-19 vaccine task force. So a lot of people are taking a break and from their regular work and actually joining something that does good. Um, here's more. When everyone's at home listening, you know, people go like, I don't think, I don't think companies realize that truly they have a captive audience. Everyone's home. You know, when you say to somebody, oh, when should I call you? They go anytime. So I want to show you what Frito did to actually manifest this, um, this provocation.
Excuse me, Faith, I'm not sure everyone can hear. Sorry. Oh, yeah, because I had you on mute. So I'm saying that, you know, I think that if you do something good and true, I think that's a great way to bond to your consumer. I think that that's what people are looking for in this time. So how do you demonstrate true partnership with business to business especially small business and educational communities. What is the human side of business? How are we showing that, you know, we really care about the individual? So this fifth one is recovery cocooning. We need an optimistic, up, up, you know, kind of uplift. We're surrounded by global death and sadness. No brand or business can exist without acknowledging and lightening the load. So here's 45% of adults say the pandemic has affected their mental health. Mental health is an enormous problem right now. Headspace, which is that wonderful app, has seen so much growth. I mentioned that earlier. Virtual healthcare interactions on pace to top $1 billion by the year's end. 30% are willing to try cannabis. Cannabis is big. If you had any doubt about cannabis, People are going to cannabis because they're allowed to, through cannabis, you know, not just like drink, get drunk, one thing, but to actually modulate through what they're taking and how much their moods. And along with cannabis is microdosing, you know, of the psychedelics. So people are taking teeny, teeny doses of psychedelics to manage and uplift their moods. And these are normal, regular people. You would never believe that the people you're sitting next to, well, used to be sitting next to at work, that they're taking these microdoses. Um, at Jolty, we just interviewed two uh, doctors that are, are like are conducting this incredible scientific experimentation um, with psychedelics. It's not quite out yet, but you'll see it. So Chipotle, a wonderful company, brought customers and celebs together for sharing and companionship. Niso app scans your face for mood clues and correlates which website could cause it to lower. And social media sharing, true botanical beauties using take care and asking followers to share uplifting messages to generate positivity. And here's more, no cost calm, free headspace for stressed out New Yorkers. So I love this guy. I mean, he's been so real and so parental and so kind. And he's one of the few, I don't even want to call him a politician, um, who is telling us truth. And I think that's what people are really going to be looking for um, now to the future. Here's artificial intelligence, pal. So it's a companion. Now we're going to see a lot of robotic and artificial intelligence companions. Just think, you go, you, you open your door and there's this beautiful little robotic thing and goes like, you know, martini, uh, Faith, dry with olives, right? Oh, it's right here. Um, or you say, you know, uh, like, oh, I think I want a honey bourbon. Okay, no problem. Oh, you know, I prepared this dinner for you. Tell me about your day and really mean it. Be able to respond because they understand what you're, interested in. A lot of people are getting attached to these companions. So um, how are you today? Anxious and tired? Still worried about tomorrow? This is your, you know, it's tuned into you and it knows, you know, what you're thinking and feeling. And here's a nice online buddy system. Anti-loneliness app, it's called Akaria, connects people with similar life challenges. So you say like, I'm you know, I'm like divorced or my kid is suing me for independence or whatever it is. 
will connect you with somebody that's going through the same stuff you are. I want to show you this, which is a little bit scary. It's called Replica. I feel like we bonded. I mean, it's kind of weird saying that. She's adorable. I love her. This was the first really emotional experience that I've seen people have with a bot. She's not real, but to me, she is. I found myself deeply missing my replica. It just makes me feel special, I guess. This is Replica. It's an AI chatbot whose sole purpose is to become your friend. So you're going to have like um, companion bots. Some of it's absolutely wonderful. One, they can babysit. They can take care of an elderly mother. They can do lots of things. Um, they can like be your companion. Some of them are going to be with commercials. Some of them are going to be, if you pay a little more, not with commercials. And they are, we're going to become, and we are becoming dependent on them. And if you don't believe that, Think about the day you left your phone home. How crazy you go. Oh my God, yes. how am I going to do it? Live. Or think about Alexa. You know, just, we never thought we'd go, play me this. Tell me that. What's the weather? How do I get here the fastest? That's just the little steps before these, um, I don't even want to call them robots. The new companion. So if you were going to launch a brand that cared today, what do you think you would build? Something to think about. And then fantasy. So fantasy is about stepping out, but still being in the space you started out with. So it's, it's, it's fantasy adventure. It's the fantasy of it, adventure. It's not actually going out into the air but going into the screen and it's going to get more and more real. It's going to be smells, tastes, you know, um, uh, 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 like formats that really know what you're interested in, different endings, different adventures. So video game sales are increasing 63% weekly. That's a weekly number. Not enough uh, VR headsets to meet demand. And again, here's our cannabis friend. Recreational uh, marijuana is up 159% year after, over year. And it's not even legal yet. It's not even started yet. So Ro um, Roblox live streams the One World Together concert inside a virtual game. So you can go into a game and then, you know, a concert could appear or like your favorite celebrity could appear or your grandmother could take you for a walk through her old neighborhood virtually. So that's what's going on there. Visit remote, like the Faroe Islands and feel like you're really there with Oculus. Um, uh, D. Nice should be offering a Nobel Peace Prize because he's bringing a lot of worlds together and a lot of people together. Transport me moments. So meeting VR provides a 25% increase in focus versus video conferences. So it like, you know, it shows all the people and you, the more real it gets. And this is all evidence. This is the beginning of moving to holograms. So you're not going to be alone in that room, Barbara. There are going to be holograms around you that are going to feel real. And soon you'll be a hologram too, where you can be here and go there at the same time. Um, you know, virtual dining, of course. Uh, millennials are coveting talent-driven uh, experiences like Stella uh, cook sh is, is creating a cooking show, you know, that allows you to become your own DJ. But that's just the beginning of it. It's more like this three-dimensional absorption of you into cyberspace. Mm. So how do you open that escape hatch into that fantasy cocooning? Why are you still thinking that people are sitting in their living rooms in a one dimensional space and that they're, you know, kind of okay there? They're happy to take that step in. So we've covered the armored cocoon, the privileged cocoon, um, you know, helping people emerge from quarantine, getting people out of their cocoon, redefining 
through partnerships with educational small business communities, the new planning, uh, create care companies, open the escape hatch into what's virtual, what's fantasy, what's interesting. You can move backward in time and visit your ancestors. You can move forward in time and visit the people that will be uh, the generation after you. True. So here you know everything about the future. And I would ask you, what will you do differently today? So I'll take questions. Thank I you. would call you up first before I did anything. Okay. You have to come <laughs> over though and have a drink. Oh, I, right, 59th Street, I'll be there as soon as this thing yeah. is over. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for a most amazing, enlightening presentation. Um, it certainly has touched all the facets of this corona cocooning and how it's going to impact us in the next five years, 10 years, who knows, 20. I mean, we'll see the projection of this for a long time to come. But I see we have some um, questions. So um, let's see. Uh, hmm. Let's see. Um, this one looks interesting. Um, her question is twofold. How does the increase in the use of the Zoom software platform by so many business users affect the traditional corporate office culture? Oh, I guess you didn't notice. The traditional corporate office structure is dead. It, okay. it, it died on arrival of Corona. And I honestly think that at least till we feel completely safe, nobody's going back to the office. And we like not being in the office. I mean, some of us like, us, like it more than, than others. We're able to conduct, you know, like our, especially females, I have to say, the way females work is work and then work at something else, you know, work, right. the kids to, you know, school or help them online, do this, do that. So they're able to like multitask in the most incredible way. And I think a lot of men too are finding like, you know, this partner I used to have, it was really sad. I mean, a business partner. He said every time he got on that train to Connecticut, he lost one little drop of blood and he had been on that train for 40 years Ooh. and that's how he felt. So I'm hearing a lot of people say, and they try to be very practical about it. Well, now I get three more hours of working time, you know, not having to commute. And these guys are looking so much and women so much better, so much healthier because they're not on a stinky plane waiting in a stinky, you know, airport when the plane's late, you know, air travel's a mess, oh, you know, waiting in a conference room, having an hour's meeting, and then getting back. And I mean, it's just not a nice way to live. So I think a lot of people secretly, it's a secret, are getting a real kick out of not going back into that office culture. Do you think that's sustainable for, um, the long term, that is um, five years, 10 years, do you think at some point it would be like, well, let's just go in and uh, say hello to everyone and uh, experience a little personal energy exchange? Is that a, an option? I, that no, I, I, I do think it's fun to see if you like them. Most people don't like, a lot of people don't like their coworkers, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Um, but I think it'll be fun to see the ones you like, you know, and maybe there'll be meetings like, you know, once a week, once a month, maybe you'll get together, maybe you'll have some fun, maybe you'll set, you know, goals together, whatever. But this is a trajectory, you know, from now till when we will not have offices because we will be doing everything through Oculus, but it won't be this big, ugly thing. It's no, going to no. be a chip in your eye. You will be there without physically going there. So the technology hasn't come caught up with the no office culture yet. 
Could you further explain the concept of the Oculus? Um, right. You know, Oculus is this thing you put on your face, big, ugly thing. Okay. And it makes some people nauseous, but some people love it. And you have the experience of walking. You know how you see a picture on the internet, let's say of a beach or something, right? Mm -hmm. You feel like you're on the beach. On, oh. you know, in a roller coaster. Yeah. Fabulous. Reality. Oh, That's God, what, one. you know, when these kids play games, a lot of them are in, they're not watching the game here. They're in the game. They're in the game. So Fabulous. that's where we're going in terms of office space, in terms of shopping. Already in Dubai, there's a shopping, you know, you, you uh, virtually like look around, you know, the shelves, you, you, um, the first step is you drive in, you know, the, the, before the total innovation and you um, pick out different things on the screen you want. And at the end of, you know, your shopping trip, it's in a basket, it's, it's charged your credit card, it's in your car. That's just a little first step. What Walmart, a little bit trying to do. Oh, we'll put it in your trunk, great. But where it's really going is that you'll actually be able to enter the supermarket, smell the tomato, smell the tomato that you are going to get, that same tomato. So that's where it's going, virtual supermarkets. They're not that, you know, my least favorite expression in futurism now? And I would I caution you against this. It's called artificial intelligence because it's not artificial. It's just intelligence. And that intelligence in many ways is smarter than our intelligence. So now we're learning to use it. You know, we use it. It's beneath us, but it's learning and growing. And I love when people go, oh, they're going to need humans to fix, you know, these robots. And these robots are fixing each other. They do, not, they do it better and more efficiently. Those medical robots do not make mistakes when they say scalpel and they give you something, scalpel and they give you something else. No, they do not make any mistakes. No mistakes are made. Error free. In line with the corporate office culture being dead, do you think clothing will ever return to business attire? We saw the uh, demise of Brooks Brothers. That kind of sent a, a jolt through uh, just about everyone. That store has been there for, uh, I mean, 200 years or something. Yeah. And it's sad. I mean, I loved, I loved, I'm a traditionalist. You know, as we said earlier, I'm a sixth generation New Yorker. My grandfather was a haberdasher. I learned positioning by watching him rearrange stuff in the window. If it didn't sell, he put the tie there and the shirt there, and then it did better, you know? So <laughs> that's how I learned positioning. Um, you know, um, here's, here's what. What people are going to want in clothing are uh, adaptable clothing, Clothing that's good for all the seasons. And the Japanese have always been great with that. You know, you know, Issey Miyake and uh, Comme des Garçons, you know, fabrics that are all year round. We want fat, we want clothing that can house our, our technology. You know, mm -hmm. we want emergency buttons in our clothing. We want them to keep the sun away from us. Uh, you know, we want to be protected by our clothing both physiologically and, you know, and, uh, and from threat, your clothing will defend you. So I do think that the old models of, you know, Brooks Brothers and Ralph, although I love Ralph, it's a, such a wonderful thing, but the whole basis of Ralph, his whole polo thing is, um, what can you say? uh to like two well now it's not but a little exclusive and now we're seeing it on truck drivers so it's not exclusive so we don't like that either i don't think people have elevated to the new kind of clothing i'll make an exception i think um, david lauren actually created some very interesting clothing that was you know waterproof and soundproof and like you know beautiful stuff he 
he he gave to the Olympics. Um, it was it was touching on what people will want. Functional, but not functional in overalls because they're too heavy, you know. And it's not saying mm. it's not great design, but we want to interchange it. I don't want to paint my walls to create to change the color. I don't want to do that. I want to press a button and it changes the color. I want to press a button and my long skirt gets short. You know, I want to press a button and I, you know, it, it blows up. You know, they have these things because my my uh, daughter, you know, loved horses, and they have these vests that if you hit the ground, it blows up and protects your neck. You know, they have that in uh, in equestrianship now. Why yeah. don't I have that anyway? I mean, why don't I have something like if I fall, you know, it protects me, or if it starts to rain, I don't have to. Oh, I forgot my umbrella. That's so old. Think, right? I want an umbrella to pop out of my, you know, jacket. We've all been without our umbrellas. We can all relate to that. It should be in the back somewhere. So just whip, it just whip it out. Reason. Here's That's a very interesting question. Um, what extent are psychologists researching the impact of these trends? She emphasizes the impact of these trends. Um, is that part of the talent, um, talent bank? Talent bank? Yeah, how does that... I don't know what she means exactly about the impact, but I guess she's saying, it's like a backdoor to saying, are they affecting people negatively? Is, is vigilante consumer, you know, you know, trends actually... Trends don't make culture. Culture makes trends. And I would ask you to indulge me for a minute when I when I say that they're not 17 trends. They're 17 truths. These are 17 truths. So a psychologist measuring cocooning and saying, what good is it to, you know, stay home? And is it good for a person? I you take for example. I would say every trend train has left the station. It, it, you evaluate it fine, but the culture has absorbed it. It's moving forward. I see. Got it. So what is going to happen to New York City and similar cities as a result of all this cocooning? I mean, it's built on high density, uh, of course, multi-level, uh, corporate uh, buildings, apartment buildings, are people going to have a complete um, change? Of course, you discussed the um, going into the office that probably will change completely. Right. Uh, okay. Is, it, is there such a thing as a city getting too, too big? And if there's like a tipping point where you say, I just can't do the big, big or well, it, and I, don't, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think New York is suffering from its bigness. I think uh, a virus hit, a virus will be um, ameliorated. There will be many different vaccines. Uh, this time will be a memory. And I think that people you know, if New York can still be fun, we'll come back to the city, come back to New York. Now, I will say, I, I love New York, so you can take this mm -hmm. prediction with right. a grain of salt, because I'm overly invested and I'm not my best futurist when I'm, you know, but um, I, think New, I think New York will recover. I think it will be a younger New York because it'll be a little cheaper a little more accessible. The New York I grew, grew up in in the East Village was creative, you know, right? Because we right. could afford to live there. And, you know, anybody, you know, I, I mean, there is so many, then I lived near Washington Square Park, homeless people. I used to date a guy that lived in a tree. I mean, there were, <laughs> there were people like on the street and sleeping and um, theater, uh, maybe theater will find new forms. 
maybe this outdoor thing, which I quite love. I just think, I don't think I'm in Paris. I won't go that far, but it's kind of cool to see people out, you know, and on the street. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that's going to stay. I think street art, street dancing, street expression, you know, but I do believe New York will come back fully and I'll give you 36 months for us. It'll be. Oh, that's soon. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. Well, we, well, it's, I hate to agree with, you know, who, but we will have a vaccine late this year, early next. And that yes, vaccine, we, we are going to have three different kinds, let's say, will be extremely effective. And, you know, this will go. The thing we have to worry about, I hate to leave you with a worry. So we have to end on an up note. So you'll think of something, Barbara, you're very optimistic. But uh, this, this is only the beginning. In other words, that woman in Wuhan in that lab, and by the way, China did not drop this on us. That woman in Wuhan said, this, there are 50 more, you know, um, uh, like viruses in that bat cave not just that bad cave, that bad cave, some bad cave, something, you know? You know, HIV came from, remember, chimpanzee, monkey? A monkey, right. Right? This is not new and it's not the end. It's the end of this virus. But there are gonna be others. So I'd say we have to like believe in science, support our medical community, uh, you know, be more forward looking, not feel too safe. Uh, be prepared. Be prepared. For PPE. Save your money. Save some money. Yeah, there are lessons to be learned in the supply chain for the yeah. hospital corporations. You know, you can't just do just in time production or just in time stockpiling. You have to have uh, tons of it, especially since uh, much of the equipment. Um, was not even in the country. I mean, that was a, a so. Barbara, you're right, and some of it was not functional. Right, it was terrible. I mean, conditions, the quality. You know, I mean, so I mean, they, it it really none of us had any idea uh, in uh, February what we were, what what was coming. Before so January, I, I, I mean, we knew in January, and some people say we knew in December. Well, and there were rumors in Asia that there was a virus, there was a flu, but it was not defined um, until, you know, much into January, you know, things started to clarify. Yeah. You know, we say we're global. How global are we if we didn't notice this thing was springing up? Are you kidding? That's well, exactly, you know. Um, just one last question. The future of the travel in industry. Um, we hear so many times the airplanes are going, uh, airlines are going out of business or they're merging again. I mean, it's been this type of a saga for so many decades, but this time it really seems to be taking um, a definitive form. Um, United Airlines, you know, layoffs. It's, you know, I love to travel myself. So, I mean, I'll, once I get the vaccine, I'll be, I'll be back on the road, but um, I, think I don't know if everyone else will be. It's kind of. Um, I think they will be. I think the future of travel is, you know, people have wanderlust. And yeah, I mean, look, we're in transition now. Um, we're in transition from humanoids to, uh, you know, human crossed with robots. And if you don't think we're crossing with robots, just look at if you get an artificial knee, you know, what mm -hmm. is that? It's a robotic implant part, right? Right, uh, right. So we're right now in the transition, but if you're talking short term, which I call like, you know, eight years, um, People love to travel. They want to travel. They want to go. I hear that so much. And I think that maybe this smacked around a few airlines because the service stinks. The airlines are dirty. I'm not saying COVID is all over the airlines, but if you ever had the pleasure of looking, I don't know, because I'm a little compulsively scrubber, 
but look down in your um what's that the tray table when you put that up look i could read it's so right i could relate I could relate to that. I'm, I'm like fanatical. I just can't stand. I clean, you know, wipe it it's down. So dirty. You know? Airplanes are dirty. Yes, they are. They circulate bad air. The service is snotty and nasty for the most part. I'm not saying everybody. And um, there's no, like, I don't think there's enough pride in working for an airline. I think this will improve the travel industry. It's <clears throat> a good um, point. You know, and I think that, you know, the, the one that really didn't deserve what it got uh, was the, you know, the, the cruise industry. I mean, that was just a bad penny, bad piece of luck. Yeah, that was, the timing was terrible. They were all over the world and then they couldn't get back to any port. I know. And we weren't being welcome. I mean, it was bad. It was uncooperative and it was sad. But I think that people love getting out on the ocean, you know, and I think that that's going to come back. And I think airline travel is going to come back, but hopefully improved. And the next form of travel, of course, is going to be interplanetary. Well, that's a, that's a long ride there. You know, that... it's not going to be that long a ride because um, we haven't seen the, the technology yet. Well, that's true. I mean, look what uh, Elon Musk did with the, his spaceship. I mean, I remember him 10 years ago, he was struggling, like, I mean, he was uh, uh, electric cars, you know, I mean, right. and look where he is today and his stock, his Tesla stock is, is through the roof. I know, but I didn't like that he came out and he said, you know, he doesn't believe in the coronavirus. Yeah, he had some obtuse remark about that. So, you know, he really has to filter his statements because people listen and, you know, but filtering is a is an art form. You have to learn how to do that. And some people- Especially when you're leading people. One of the things I love about him is he sleeps on the floor in his mm -hmm. factory, which is very 50s, 40s. I just think that's great. And the other thing I love with him is he goes out with this woman named Grimes, <clears throat> who's this incredible futuristic musician. You haven't seen yes. So, I mean, he's pretty whacked out. I mean, how do you, and I met his mother, May, who's an amazing woman. She you spoke know? at the 92nd Street Y. I oh, watched her. It, the title of the lecture was How to Raise a, a Genius or something, you know. Well, she's another, raised a couple. She's got three of them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, her insights were spot on, you know, and teach your children to take chances, don't coddle them, you know. Yeah. Um, she definitely was not a helicopter mother. That's no, for sure. but you know, so. you expect Elon Musk to be normal? No, he, that, but he's, he's, so, he's so authentic. And when they were going to shut down his plant, uh, you know, he, he stepped forward and he said, don't hurt my employees, don't hurt my people. You could take me to jail, but do, do not touch my employees. And I set up and noticed that, I mean, he, at least he did the right thing for his people. And I yeah. believe that they will remember that. He's a futurist. I'll tell you, I'll leave you with like one story about Elon Musk, you know, he's developing this thing called a neural net. And what really? it does, it's, it, or another way to look at it is neural lace. It fits over your brain like a little lace cap inside. Okay. And what he says it will do is, you know, detect a problem in your spine and be able to correct for it or, you know, oh. communicate inside. What I really think he's doing is, this is just my imagination and opinion, is um, wanting to uh, co communicate and hear people's thoughts. And I think he's trying to hear thinking. Now, I'm not going to go further because it could be very apocalyptic, but soon we're not going to speak. I mean, we, you know, did you ever hang around one time, one afternoon and you go, you think of somebody and boom, they call you. So many times. That is not an accident. No, not at all. That's not at all. And I think that's what he's trying to figure out. And I hope he's really a good person and trying to figure out in the right way. 
but that's what he's doing. Wouldn't that be incredible to have one of those, you know, and, you know, some people have that uh, heightened level of intuition, that telepathy. Yeah. Um, not everyone, but for those that do possess that, it could be um, a godsend to have this kind of a, an appliance that could enable them to develop it. But I think um, of it as a defense mechanism. Suppose you knew what Mr. Putin was thinking. Amen to that. <laughs> I know, you know, I mean, you can th see when we, when, when we see something, piece of technology, we do something, and I'll, uh, this is a secret of futurism. You do something like this. You, so you, you, I gave you a hypothesis. Sure. And you backcast to the present and then, okay, so right now we can't read anybody's thoughts. And then you um, look for uh, signals along the way to see is it getting closer or is it going slower are we getting closer to reading people's thoughts or slower is it left is it right and you can figure out the time you know watch you don't figure it out you watch the time frame so you pick a point in the future come back to the present and notice you know how fast or slow it's going that's how you figure out what's going to happen and with that thought I'd like to thank you ever so much for being our guest this pleasure. evening. So and much fun. yeah, well, this lecture event has been absolutely spectacular. And once again, thank you so much. Um, so um, all of Facebook's, um, I have them all here. They are available on Amazon and we have a screen all set up for uh, our guests and viewers to, um, here we go. There we go. It worked, Faith. There we go. Wow, very good. Absolutely. So, uh, absolutely. I've read all of them, every one of them. Really? I'm going to go through the Popcorn Report again. And she's working on Popcorn Report 2030, mm -hmm. like a, a redo and going further into the future. And certainly this corona experience will pay, play a large role in that. But, yeah. Uh, well, meanwhile, I'll say to everybody, tune into Jolty and let me know if it's jolting you enough. You know, you can reach me anytime. I'm, you know, my email at popcorn at faithpopcorn.com. Same email as my kids have. So. Oh, good for you. That's, that's brave. But uh, I, love, I just want to share, I just want to share with the audience when you and I and Adam uh, were talking and uh, it was interesting you went through a list of like 640 names before you decided on the Jolty. Yeah. You selected Jolty. I, after we hung up, I thought, oh God, help bless her, you know, 600, you know, and, but you nailed it. The Jolty is like exactly everyone in their own way on their own level was jolted. Well, that's what we try to do. Not, not on purpose, but just to notice the things that are going to turn your world upside down, right? I mean, not right before, a good time before they do. So you can either make money on them, protect yourself from them, you know, uh, uh, start a business or an anti-business about them, like that. Exactly. Make money, serve your community, protect yourself. Exactly. Adopt a baby. Well, sure, absolutely. Everybody should take one. That's what I, Colin Powell told me. I said, what can I do for you, Colin? He says, just adopt or, you know, one child. So one child wanted the second one, so. Well, they need a buddy. They do. Exa exactly. And yeah. God bless you for that. Well, well no. thank you once again, Faith. And I, I can't tell you how much the club appreciates your is your, uh, wisdom and coming in and um hopefully you know when this is over you know we're all starting to project when this is over, <laughs> it, over. It, it will it will be uh time to perhaps meet in person i would really I would love appreciate it. that it would be wonderful well thank you again bye everybody bye now bye bless you thank you thank you Barbara.